Well, good morning. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to get to um, join you again as we study the Gospel of John. We are in uh, chapter 20. We are nearing the end of this wonderful book. It has been an incredible study, I believe, uh, for many of us. I hear all the time um, people express those aha moments where they say that I have studied the Gospel of John before, but for whatever reason, this year it just has hit me in different ways. And there are things within it that I had never saw before. And I have felt that very same thing. Before we get started, um, I want to just uh, stop for a, so a moment and I want to pray for um, a class member's husband who's in the hospital. So will you join me in prayer? Father, I just lift up Jason to you today. And um, I just ask, Lord, um, that you would do a marvelous healing in his body, that you would restore him to health, that you would put a hedge of protection around him, that nothing further would come as an assault against him, that you would put a hedge of protection around Bethany and the children, that the fears and the doubts that come in the dark um, will flee. Father, I have seen throughout this Gospel of John, from the very beginning, when you changed the water in, into wine, just because of love for our family, and throughout it, you did miracles, you healed, you restored, um, you renewed people, you did amazing things, and you are the God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so, Father, we believe that you can do this. We believe that for this precious family, you would restore Jason to health that he wouldn't have any lingering effects, um, that you would provide and protect. And so, Father, we ask this. We ask you to do what you have done before, that you would do it again. Father, we believe. We know that you can, so help us in our unbelief. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we start uh, John 20. Um, in verses 24 through 31, and we're looking at Thomas. And, um, and this is a, a section that is all about doubt. You know, there are differing opinions. I mean, um, uh, uh, opinions that are very, very broadly about doubt. Some people uh, believe that doubt represents total unbelief. And others believe that doubt is more of the raw side of honesty. And some also believe that it's the right of every believer to go through the halls of doubt to come into the rooms of faith. So we need to be courageous believers. We need to have courageous believers who are courageous enough to struggle in faith. Those who are courageous to share that they're wrestling with doubt. Those who wonder why it seems at times that God is so mysteriously silent. Can you relate to that? where your prayers seem like they go to the ceiling and they come right back down. We need to know as believers, if we are going to walk victoriously on this side of heaven, if we're going to be a testimony and witness to the goodness and the glory of God, we need to know how to push through those times of uncertainty. When to our human thinking of God, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. But I want you to know that God is in the midst of our reflection. He is in the midst of our wrestling. And the truth is, is that from our searching, we will come to a deeper depth of understanding of faith in God. God honors sincere doubts. And, you know, throughout uh, church history, there have been many prominent thinkers um, who wrestled with doubt. The first one, um, Mother Teresa known as one of the greatest humanitarians in the 20th century, she revealed her own crisis of faith in a letter to a friend. And this is what she wrote. Where is my faith? Even deep down, right in there is nothing but emptiness and darkness. My God, how painful is this unknown pain? I have no faith. I dare not utter the words and the thoughts that crowd my heart. And then C.S. Lewis, he wrestled with doubt and he said, a Christian with reasonable faith still experiences times when his emotions rise up and carry out a sort of an attack on his belief. And then Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, wrestled with doubt. And he said, trouble can strengthen and trouble can reveal the work that needs to be done in us. 
Tears can clear the eye so that we see with an improved vision and perspective. Losses reveal the insufficiency of all the things around us that we cherish, enabling us to appreciate the all-sufficiency of Christ even more. And then we can turn to Scripture, and we can see the responses of two great men of faith who responded so differently when they encountered God. The first one, Moses, out of Exodus 3. Moses was a man who was 80 years old when he encountered God on the side of the mountain in a burning bush. And God said to him to lead the Exodus. And Moses' response, it was one of reluctance. He asked, why me, Lord? Why would you ask that of me? Who am I? And then we have a totally different response from the prophet Isaiah centuries later, which is recorded in Isaiah 6, which is a wonderful passage. You need to look it up and read it again. But Isaiah encounters God in an awesome and holy vision, and he can hardly wait for the question to end before he answers. The Lord asks, whom shall I send? And without hesitation, Isaiah responds, here I am, send me. Two completely different responses. And God worked in through in and through both of them. And then, turning to the New Testament, we have a man who's honest enough to tell Jesus to his face of his doubt. In Mark 9, it tells the story of this man and his son. His son had been suffering with demons for a lengthy amount of time. And he says to Jesus, but if you can, but if you can, but if you can heal my son. And Jesus picks up on that immediately. He says, but if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father cries out, I believe. Help my unbelief. Have you ever felt like that? If you're, Have you ever honestly said to God, I know that you are able, but the problem isn't on your end. It's on mine. On mine, help me in my unbelief. You may be, this morning, wrestling with doubt. And if so, I want you to relax. Because life circumstances you found yourself in, you are wondering, you're questioning, you're doubting. And I want you to hear that God has given us permission to question in all sincerity. In our lesson today <clears throat> of Thomas, we will find that that is true. God has given us permission to question in all sincerity and he honors honest doubters. But as I, tr I, I trust that as we look at Thomas, that we might see beyond his nickname, um, that, that nickname that he has been given, Doubting Thomas. In fact, I wonder how would we feel if for centuries after our own crisis of faith, we would be known as Doubting Thomas or Doubting Pam or Doubting Sarah, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I hope that we can extend grace to him this morning and give the story some dignity. Maybe we can see Thomas as a pessimist or perhaps a realist or even as one who is reflective in nature. Or maybe just as someone who is just darn plainly <laughs> wrestling with doubt. And I, I believe that if we look at him from that perspective, we will be able to relate to the struggle. So Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So that leads us to our very first division and it's our first and only division. It is Thomas, pessimist, realist, reflective, or just plain wrestling with doubt. And we're gonna look at uh, John 20, 24 through 29. We're gonna look at John eleven sixteen and John 14, one through six. We're gonna start with John eleven sixteen. 16. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, a little bit of background. Uh, they have heard that, uh, that Lazarus is, um, is asleep, as they believe. Um, they don't realize that he's asleep as unto death. But Jesus wants to return to Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem. The disciples know that that's dangerous territory. If, if Jesus would appear in uh, Jerusalem or a word um, had gotten out that he was near Jerusalem, the uh, religious leaders would have sent someone to try to kill him. So Thomas says, he says to them, and he speaks on behalf of the fellow disciples, he says, let us also go that we may die with him. 
So our first encounter with Thomas, and from this we might say that he was a pessimist, right? Is the glass half empty or half full? That's a common expression that we use to determine if you're a pessimist, which is half empty, or an optimist, who, which is half full. Um, and we could say, based on this first encounter with Thomas, that he was a glass half empty type of guy. He couldn't see any other outcome of returning to Jerusalem but death. But Thomas's pessimism should not be allowed to obscure his courage. Though he thought that the situation was hopeless, he nonetheless was willing to lay down his life for the Lord. His love for Jesus, it was so strong that he would have preferred to die with him rather than be separated from him. Now, the next time we see Thomas is in John 14, 1 through 6. And it says this, the Lord said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Now, I want you to notice once again the personal pronoun. Thomas used it in the same question back in 1116. He said, let us also go that we may die with him. And here he says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? He asked the questions that everyone is thinking but is afraid to ask. He spoke for all the disciples in that moment. He's saying that, you say that we should know the way, but we don't know the way. Just just tell us. Just tell us plainly how to get there. And then we have this wonderful verse, verse 6. And Jesus responds, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Even though Thomas didn't fully understand this at that time, well done, Thomas. Good question. Because Jesus then reveals himself as the, the, as the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father but through him. So now that brings us to John 24. And Thomas is in the midst of a crisis of faith. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. It's too bad that Thomas missed the Lord's appearance when the Lord appeared to the ten disciples. And we wonder why. He wasn't there. The scripture doesn't say, but Thomas was in grief. He's broken. His hopes have been crushed and his dreams have been shattered. When he saw the blood and the nails, he checked out. He thought it was over. And the one that he had loved so greatly was gone and his heart was broken. He needed time to grieve his loss, but he missed Jesus's appearance. You know, it is true that everyone grieves differently. But we have to remember that in our grief, we must guard against isolating because when we isolate ourselves, we miss the encouragement, the comfort, and the support of other believers and from our family and friends. And Thomas isolated and he missed the Lord's appearance to the ten. But God, because God hasn't forgotten Thomas, with Thomas's hopes dashed and his dreams lost, He's somewhere in the streets. He's somewhere in the hillside, but God knows where he's at. And so then his friends pass the word to him. We've seen him. Verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas says, in effect, risen, risen. This is, this is just too good to be true. I will not allow myself to hope until I can be sure my hope will not be dashed once again. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and I place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. He wanted concrete proof, not to satisfy his doubt, but rather to overcome his hopelessness. It was that remark, unless I see, I will never believe, that earned him the nickname of Downey Thomas. But in truth, the track record of the other ten apostles 
wasn't stellar either. They too had scoffed when at the initial reports of Jesus' resurrection, and they failed to believe that the, what the scriptures had predicted. Thomas was just honest, wasn't he? He was just honest that he was wrestling with doubts. You know, God honors our sincere doubts, and he will meet Thomas exactly in his doubt and answer his question, but not until eight days later. So for eight days, the Lord gave Thomas time to reflect and to think. You know, the Lord never wastes a delay. He's never too late, and he's never too early. His delays are always with a purpose, and there's an end in sight. The scripture doesn't tell us where Jesus was during those eight days, but we know that Thomas was not forgotten from him. And on the eighth day, Jesus appears. So eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Once again, the disciples, they're gathered in a, uh, um, in a room with the door behind locked doors. But this time, instead of just 10 disciples, there are 11 because Thomas was with them. And Jesus came just as he did the last time. And he stood among them and he said, Thomas, front and center, where is that doubter? I am so tired of answering his questions. No, a thousand times no. What did Jesus say? He said, Shalom. Shalom, that ancient word of peace. May you all know peace, he says to them. May the blessing of peace fall on all of leaven of you men. How precious is that? And then he turns and says to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. How gentle and kind is our Lord Jesus Christ. He met Thomas at the point of his wrestling, at the very point of his doubt. And he met him without rebuke, without rebuke. Why, we wonder. After all, he is God and he could have commanded Thomas to believe, but he doesn't. He doesn't because of his character. And because he knows us, Psalm 103, 8 through 14 speaks so clearly of God's character and the nature of man. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in, in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And then in verse 14, it speaks of the nature of man. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God knows how we were formed. He knows our frame. This is in reference to, Gen to the creation of man in Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. It's not that we are dust in the sense of here today and gone tomorrow because God values us much more than that. But God remembers that the finiteness of the human perspective. Dust is not eternal or omniscient, and neither are we. Our gracious and loving God is patient with the frailties of his people. He's patient with us. And the Lord met Thomas at the very point of his weakness and doubt, and he met him without rebuke. In patient compassion, he gave Thomas the realistic proof that Thomas had asked for. Thomas, don't give in to your doubts any longer. Just believe. See, God honors our honest doubts, and he answers our sincere questions. And Thomas answers him, my Lord and my God. That was enough for Thomas. In light of the undeniable evidence, all his disbelief and his doubt dissolved forever. And Thomas's statement is, it's a clear confession of his newly found faith in Jesus Christ. 
and perhaps is the greatest confession of any of the apostles, my Lord and my God. You know, John's entire purpose in writing the book, the Gospel of John, is that all readers may come to confess Jesus as their Lord and God in the same way that Thomas did. Now, in our leaders' um, core group discussion time, one of the core leaders said this, and I thought it was excellent. I want to share this with you. She said, to identify God creator alone, that's spiritualism. To identify Lord master alone, that's religion. But true Christianity has to claim both, my Lord and my God, because true Christianity, it's a relationship with God the creator and the Lord who is our master. Thomas affirmed not only that he believed in Jesus' resurrection from the dead, but also that he believed everything that Jesus had said about himself before that. The creator of the universe had come to the earth, lived, ministered, died, and risen again. And Thomas believed. Gone was the doubt. In place was faith. And Jesus responds in verse 29. Thomas. Now that you've seen me, you believe. But there are those who have never seen me with their eyes, but have believed in me with their hearts. And they will be blessed even more. Jesus, he accepted Thomas's affirmation of his deity. Indeed, he praised Thomas for his faith. But he looks also ahead to a time when, there's a, when the tangible physical evidence that Thomas had witnessed would no longer be available. And the Lord pronounced that those are blessed who did not see and yet believe. You are in the scriptures. Did you know it? Blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. You are in the they of that sentence. Not blessed are those who never question, but blessed are the ones who find those few things that they can rely on and their faith finds a resting place. Thomas has made it through the minefield of doubt. And he, now he stands before the risen Lord, a miracle, and proclaims, my God and my Lord. You know, I want you to hear this, that Jesus never questioned the need for evidence in matters of faith, which is why that he offered signs to validate his identity and to confirm his message. But he was selective in, in his use of tangible evidence because he knew that no amount of proof would satisfy a skeptic. Because, you know, you have to remember that faith and evidence, they're not unrelated in the spiritual life of a Christian. They go together, but our starting point, um, our starting point is crucial. We need to trust in God. That must come first. And then evidence is helpful. But apart from belief, evidence is virtually meaningless. Refusal to believe and evidence, it just results in confusion. Willingness to believe and evidence, that results in confidence or faith. Have you ever been drawn into a discussion with a skeptic? Someone who demands evidence before belief? Um, I want you to say that if you do that again, avoid offering proof of anything because you'll only be drawn into pointless debates. So instead, what we have to focus on is the real issue at hand. It's the issue of sin, their need for a savior. And when a lost person comes to terms with their sin, they and, and they do that genuinely, then belief in, um, is the next logical step. And ironically, what they do is they find great comfort and confidence in the historical fact of Christ's resurrection. So now in closing, I turn to my friends who are skeptics. I cannot and I will not try to argue you into the kingdom of God. But throughout the last eight months, you have heard the truth. You have heard the truth. You, you have read and you have studied the many signs and the miracles that Jesus Christ has done. And now you come to a point of decision. Everyone comes to a point of decision. John closes chapter 20 with these words. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by leaving you may have life in his name. Now is the time for you to set aside your demand for signs and wonders. You are aware that you've missed God's holy mark. 
that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. The Savior came. Jesus Christ came. He suffered on the cross in your place. He took your sin and paid in full, meeting the holy standard of God. He died and was resurrected, and now he sits at the right hand of God. And he offers you today his robe of righteousness that was bought by his precious blood. I pray that you will bend a knee. The God of creation is calling out your name. So bend a knee and believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And now I turn to you, my dear friends, who know the Lord, and you have put your faith in him but you find that you are wrestling with doubt. Know that throughout any life that is lived realistically and reflectively, that you will come to places where you feel that you cannot hope. But rest assured, these are some of the healthiest places in life and the hardest. But it's a place where you will come to the deepest depths of understanding and spiritual growth. So my friends, be willing to risk and to fail. Don't always play it safe. You know, it takes courage to wrestle with doubt. But know that within it is God's opportunity for growth spurts. My friend, shalom, peace. Look at his hands and feel his side by faith. He isn't here. He has risen so may the gracious and gentle Good Shepherd lead you through the halls of doubt into the rooms of faith. I want you to know that Thomas went on to be faithful and powerful and faithfully and powerfully serve the Lord. He traveled to India and was a missionary there and made many trips establishing churches in southern India. And it was on one such trip where he was actually stabbed as a martyr for Christ. Now, our children's director, Jenny Carlson, she's gone to India um, a number of times. She and her family work closely with the ministry um, to India. And they travel to both the northern and the southern part. And she says that there is a spiritual darkness that you can literally feel when you are in the northern part of India. But it's amazing when you travel down to the southern part of India, there are still churches there and the spiritual climate changes dramatically and you feel the presence of God in that area. It is amazing what God can do with a man who has walked the halls of doubt and has come into the room of faith. You know, God honors honest doubters. So let me close in prayer. Lord, my Lord and my God, we still have our doubts and our fears and we haven't put life all together and we won't until we are on the other side of heaven. So Father, thank you for your steadfast love. Thank you for being patient when we ask questions again and again. Lord, we trust the living one whose wounds for us do plead. We weep when we lose friends and family, but we still love you. When we question, it isn't that we doubt your right to rule. It's just that we struggle so with releasing our own rights and our own desire to reason our way through the valley. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for the message of a book like Thomas, who finally said, My Lord and my God. Father, we say these things and pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ and for all your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May you have a blessed week, and I will see you next week.